Marlboro Reds, I heard, are like really rough cigarettes too. Oh, dude, they're they're called cowboy killers. Oh man, <laughs> awful, awful stuff. Why those cigarettes? Because I thought the name cowboy killer was really cool. Oh. <laughs> and I was really in high school. I was really big into metal. Job for a cowboy, Pantera, all that stuff. And so I just thought there was something metal about smoking like the harshest cigarette. Yeah, they should probably consider warning people about these cigarettes. Yeah, <laughs> but I smoked literally up until the moment I couldn't go into basic training. <laughs> Just join the military, that'll cure you. <laughs> what is PTSD? So post-traumatic stress disorder is just, it's like an aftershock of whatever traumatic event you've gone through. It's just the brain, or amphibian brains, wired to like hyper-focus on something that was traumatizing so that we can use threat avoidance to that later. I don't know if you want to call it bad wiring, like a chemical change in the brain. There's a lot that comes with it. Trouble sleeping, irritability, mood changes, uh, all that kind of stuff. My entire character and the way I interacted with other people and uh, just my general outlook significantly changed. I was just very antagonistic, kind of like I was like a wounded animal, like lashing out. Like a general increased uh, heart rate, feeling like uh, this weird... Hmm... It's just, uh, you feel hemmed in. Just, like, trapped. I was hanging out at my dad's house, like, way after I got out, and sitting there drinking with them and you know, just talking about stories and stuff, and then, like, I remembered it all. And, like, being under the influence really, like, makes it easier to, like, be prone to those kind of thoughts again and uh, take you back to that dark place. He knows that I'm di diagnosed by the VA and I kind of told him like hey man if you ever went through anything in the military you should get that diagnosed was he the first person you opened up to about it first person I opened up to was way farther from my chain of people that I knew the first person I opened up to was like a stranger on the internet they didn't know my name and I don't even remotely remember them I was just like hey man this is all the stuff I'm going through and they're like damn that sucks and I'm like yeah I feel better thanks so yeah, I just unloaded on, on someone on the internet. Granted, like we were friends and we played video games together, but I kept it pretty far from my circle at first because I didn't want them looking at me differently. What if my loved ones turn from me? Because that's a story that they just can't handle having that person around them anymore. My mom's a worrier. She was in the military for 20 years, but she's she's definitely a worrier. And I thought that like if I came out with it, she'd become you know even more overbearingly like protective of, of me and stuff, and like coddle me like a child. And it's like I'm a war veteran. I don't want to be you know handled like this fragile, cute thing. Who was the first person in your inner circle that you told? My cousin. Well, I don't probably don't want his name in there, but my cousin. You come home, they give you like 14 days as kind of like a break. And he lived within eight hours of me, so I could go visit him. I told him the whole Helmand River Valley story. He was real sympathetic and stuff uh, at first. I love him to death. Like, me and him are really close now. But I did say something that made him mad. He threw uh, the Helmand River Valley story back in my face, and he's like, Well, you fucking you killed women and children. Like, 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 he did the argument attack on me for whatever messed up joke I said. That was my <laughs> that was one of my worst fears is somebody else weaponizing my my worst trauma against me. And so, yeah, I was really hurt. My feelings on it are still pretty much the same. Like there's still guilt and shame about like that mission. I don't think that'll ever go away. That's just something like the, the rest of my life will be a somewhat big thing about who I am as a person. When that was thrown back in my face at that time, I was still really kind of <laughs> on fragile ground. So when he threw that back in my face, it set me back a while. I didn't talk to someone about the Helmet River Valley story for like three years after that. And I think the next person I told was uh, another person that was out of my circle. And then like the first person I told in my circle was my buddy, my best friend. And even then I, I, I neutered the story quite a bit. I had a Civcas incident in, in Afghanistan, and I pretty much just left it at that rather than spill it all. I'm sure we were like drinking one night, and he just it just came up. What had happened with uh, my cousin just made me not trust other people with the story. I did actually have a sit-down chat with a therapist from the VA and kind of told him everything. I told him the same stuff I told you, like how I do meditation and I write and stuff. But he's like, you should always try to like get into these support groups. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to pass for now. I might do it eventually in the future, but uh, <laughs> still wasn't wholly into the idea that uh, that I really wanted to fully embrace the fact that I have PTSD. Like, okay, cool, I have this diagnosis and all this stuff, but 
still trying to do it all on my own. Did you ever end up going to a support group? No, no, I didn't. Somebody else would tell a story, and it would it would tell me a story, and it would make me feel bad about like I haven't gone through like half of what this dude what this dude did, and I didn't really want to feel inferior to like their PTSD. I feel like there was always <laughs> a worry in my mind that it would be like a uh, like a judgment thing, and uh, it's probably not. It's just that was my own hang up on it, why I didn't do it. It's got uh, like it's good days where like I feel like a perfectly normal person with no issues. Then there's <clears throat> then there's like once in a blue moon where it's just like the entire day has just been sunk by like me remembering it and just being back in that that initial place. Not meditation, not the writing, none of it helps. And I just have to weather the storm and just hope that the next day will be better. That I'll just wake up and I'll feel better. Uh, I mean, there are specific days like like anniversaries of stuff that I remember. Uh, typically is like a wash of a day for me. Just like I've had combat shoots on Christmas before. I had two combat shoots on Christmas. It's really hard to get into the uh, the uh, gift-giving season because I remember, oh man, I had killed people on Christmas. That's not Mary. This is my alternate angle camera. It was the only thing I could find that was the right height. So uh, just ignore the creepy clown staring at you. <laughs> You can, you can make it something friendlier than a clown. Where do you feel like you are with your PTSD now? I've generally accepted it now. It's overbearing at first. It's unbelievably overbearing at first. Uh, soul crushing. But the longer it goes, uh, the more it becomes your your new normal. And it's not as devastating as it, as it was in the beginning. If you could tell everyone in the world one thing, what would it be? Um, oh, man. I should have thought about this before going into it. If you are going with through like PTSD or you're in a particularly hard place, people are a lot more compassionate than you give them credit for. And if you turn to them for support, you will find people that will will help you out. <laughs> I think I was good. I was I think I was on a roll until I got to that part. We'll fix it in post. <laughs> and cut. <laughs>